Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You can get a job in the Middle East simply by trying or by magic through others or by a fluke. Remember that competition is everywhere. Some here, some there, but bam, Loy Macedo is the best. All right, in this video, I'm going to give you my thoughts about having toxic parents, how to manage toxic parents, handling them, and uh, general uh, life experiences. Because, you know, my parents were exceptionally toxic. I mean, if you know my history, you know that my stepfather used to uh, physically beat me, mentally abuse me. Uh, abuse me in the sense always called me like loser and mistake and uh, he would insult me in front of other people make me stand in front of the public and humiliate me and make me stand outside the door where all the neighbors were watching for hours and hours and he uh, one of the worst human beings um, and in the office he used to be a very nice polite guy at home he used to bully me and now when I look at it like Short, piddly fuck, five feet uh, coward that he was. He is. Um, I'm glad I got away from him. He's still alive uh, and he's just rotting away, which I'm very glad. So anyway, um, so I have my whole experience right from childhood where he used to actually beat me with a rubbery uh, bamboo cane. And he used to hit me non-stop for 45 minutes to an hour. How do I know that? Because I used to literally watch the time. And he used to beat me. Even if I would urinate, that violently would hit me where my skin, blood used to come out. And um, he, he would slap me where my face would swell and I couldn't hear in one ear. Um, he believed that was discipline. Okay. And... Uh, just imagine hitting a six-year-old, seven-year-old small boy to the point where he's literally bleeding, okay? Um, this was my stepfather. And my mother, uh, she was only interested in money. She was only interested in making money and I don't know why she even gave birth if this was the case. Like, for her, the purpose of having a child was... To ensure that your financial, you're financially secure when you're old. She looked at having a child as having kind of an investment. I have this child, I put in money, I'll get money when I'm old. And she used to literally explicitly tell me on my face, you, why did I bring you into this world? For what? You have to take care of your parents and you have to this and you have to that. And, and she... And, you know, when she wanted me to feel bad, oh, you're a mistake, you're dirty blood. Dirty blood means my first father, she would always call me that. And uh, she would also compare me to other children. Oh, that girl is so smart. Not like you, oh, that boy, see how obedient he is. Oh, he knows how to dress up and insult. And there, there was never compliments. So anyway, I will, I will share with you all this. And... Uh, how did I break away from them? How did I repair the damage that they put into my life? And uh, what is my advice to you? Okay, so all this I'll try to cover. And if I have not addressed any particular issue, just comment down below. All right, so in case you're new to my channel, my name is Loy Macedo, personal branding strategist. I help people get well-paying jobs in Dubai, UAE, uh, Gulf countries, uh, Saudi Qatar, Bahrain, Oman. And people also take my advice, counsel, practical experience on how to earn more money per hour, whether it's as an employee, you know, to climb up or, you know, online, offline business. And finally, people take my advice for personal challenges or personal issues and professional challenges. The details are put down below. Okay, so um, just to give you a summary so that you know, my real father's name is Daniel Leslie Macedo. 
um he was a guy from the ship shippy uh he was from kerala uh my mother was from mangalore okay it seems maybe he impressed her with his because he was traveling and all that so uh and here's a funny bit before him my mother used to go to damaskati that is in mangalore she used to go to this particular school uh some school local school and there peter paul pinto that was my future stepfather so they both were close they both she liked him or they both liked each other but the minute she saw this guy this shippy guy and she saw big money or better life she dumped his ass and went for him so <laughs> my mom was a classic uh, i don't know today you call it gold digger i don't know what you call that time well she wanted a better life and but it turned out that this guy uh, daniel leslie masiro my father after i got gave birth to me it seems seems i don't know how far it's true he liked to have women and have sex with a lot of women in fact he even had sex with the maid who used to come and clean because she was a young girl um, it seems she was 18 or 16 or something and then she killed herself actual story huh? and uh, then they because she committed suicide so they gave compensatory money to hush hush everything this is what i was told by my mother and relatives so i don't know how far it's true i'm i'm being honest with you okay they were staying in andheri and uh, then it seems had sex with someone else and had a baby or something like that and again paid money so he couldn't keep his sausage in his pants he always had to chew 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 okay <laughs> so so then my mother had i guess enough and uh, asked for a divorce and she asked for my custody and obviously i guess uh, my mother's sister's husband whose name was harry he was also a shippy that time he was more like a macho kabir bedi kind so he got a little afraid of him he said okay fine we have a clean divorce you go your way i go my way fine okay so then my mother from bombay or mumbai as they call it she decided okay want to make some money and all that and people were going to the gulf which was dubai uh that time dubai was not a brand or uae they just knew the gulf they would call it the gulf so she decided okay i'll try my luck there and lo and behold after she landed in uae sarja which is sarja dubai neighbors she found this guy peter paul pinto and uh, they were working that time for this emirati billionaire his name was bukathir uh those who have been in uae for 70s 80s 60s bukathir was the first emirati who had the cricket matches between india and pakistan and it was all rigged and this gambling and all that so he was very famous for that he also had imitac e m i t a c i don't know if that company still exists in uae he had it in 80s he also had health club uh he had you know different different businesses so he was you know and you're talking of a small place like uae which was nothing but a full desert with just small buildings popping up like two story one story or three story uh, like there's one building and maybe 5 minutes there's nothing else another building with two three shops so it was a very like a virgin territory and whoever went there to uae first uh, you just grow because as business would grow if you joined as a junior when there were more businesses you are asked to manage more so obviously you are given manager title then if they would expand more you would be given senior manager so the chances for you to grow were so easy <clears throat> my mother was able to capitalize on this so she was working health club she was working expo expo was more like uh, international tourist uh, exhibitors and all that so she she would work there and she would work in a video shop and those days in uae they would take original videos there was no internet there was no uh, piracy laws nothing you take a cassette tape which you would get from abroad 
and you would record it on VHS tapes. Those days there were VHS tapes, record 20 copies and give it for rent and make your money. So she was working like that in one of those video shops, local some name. I remember seeing the photograph. I remember being there, wish I had kept copies. Okay, so my mother was very enterprising. Okay, uh, and why I'm telling you all this so you understand where the toxicity comes from. So my mother was morning, she would work for the health club, you know, teaching exercise and gym and massage and uh, and they would get good tips. Mostly they would get all these uh, foreigners who would come there or Arabs or whatever. It was like more like a premium club. And then uh, evening she would work in this video shop, get extra. And she even used to work freelance. And later on, because of the customers who would come to the health club, whether it was a rich Arab lady or it was a sheikh's wife, or those days it was very easy to meet a sheikh's wife. Very, very easy. And there were very few places where they would go. Um, so she developed a good contact base and she was earning, if you were to compare by today's standards, I would say easily, easily, I think she was making $10,000 a month, $10,000 or $15,000 a month. Good money for someone who, I mean, her profile was just like a receptionist. Just imagine, she, her personality, if I were to evaluate her personality today, she would just be like, like an office clerk. I'm, I'm not trying to put her down. I'm actually telling you. Because she didn't know how to draft a letter. She didn't know anything. She didn't know correspondence. She just knew like, like hardworking. Like she could be an air, air hostess, like just deliver, uh, you know, food to, you tell, okay, give all these people food. And even when she applied for Air India, you know, what did she do? <laughs> this actually happened. She put so much makeup. When she went there, they said, the, the guy called, he called her, come, come here. Who put this makeup? She said, my friend put. He said, my dear, do me a favor. Just go wash all the makeup. Just, just wash it and come here. I want you to have natural beauty. She had put so much powder and so much rouge and so much. Design. She looked like a clown. Okay, so that is, give you an idea of my mother. But even though she didn't have all these, you know, the education, the guidance, she had a burning fire to make money and she was obsessed. And in the 80s, for a female who had nothing, who came to UAE with nothing, she ended up with, I think, three, uh, three houses or four houses and uh, plots of land and she was like nearly a millionaire. That is how like successful she was. And she would save. She believed in this the sad Indian mentality of being a miser. The shampoos were the cheapest, the soaps were the cheapest, the coffees were complimentary. She would take if she could get free coffee, free tea, free tissue, free this. She wanted to just save all the money and maximize on maximize on savings and be rich okay for retirement so she viewed me also as one of that investment where she didn't think she had to spend time because obviously she's so busy you know so now given the fact that she was so busy with so many things um somebody has to take care no when they come home so shocking as it was those days she met Peter Paul Pinto, who later on, I don't know how he changed his name, Frederick Pinto, he called himself. They were staying together without getting married, which was a big shocker those days. But they said, oh, this is modern relationship and whatever. They got married through court later on, much later when I was, I think, maybe 10 years old or 9 years old, whatever. They got married really late on. So they were staying without getting married, which was a major scandal but nobody knew about it so uh, but for me i always thought this is my mom and this is my dad that's what i thought so mom always working and here's this man peter paul pinto frederick pinto whom i thought was father now he was a classic by today's standard simp he literally worshipped her 
He followed every instruction she gave and she was very leadership and enterprising that way. And he was a data entry operator and receptionist. So she told him, this is what I came to know later through my relatives. On, she told him, make sure that you discipline this boy. Make sure you discipline me. Because one is she gave the excuse of the Bible, you know, spare the rod and, you know, this the child and spoil the child and whatever. And she also believed the only way to discipline me because I was very naughty boy was proper with a cane, beat him properly. She literally gave him the explicit permission. And remember this, how I know this for a fact is because he was like a slave for her. He worshipped her. He never had any other girl. He totally loved her. And there is no man on this planet who can raise his hand on a woman's child unless she gives him the explicit permission. So, well, he got the permission. And my mother had used the same strategy with my teachers. So even my teachers were busy physically abusing me. By today's standard, many of them should be arrested because they would take like a ruler and hit me on the knuckles and put pencils and squeeze my hand and slap me and hit me and, you know, total abuse. Huh? Because there was no rules of uh, those days. And this was one of those cheaper schools. So, and all Indian, Indian teachers, Indian management. Okay. So, you would violently hit me. Oh, my goodness. And, well, ADHD was not invented. So, nobody knew about it. So, he thought I was just possessed by the devil or I was just hyper. So, you would beat me violently, man. Ugh. Violently. And then, obviously, compare me to others. He's so smart. You're so dumb. In the class, you would literally, you know, sometimes pull my ear and behave yourself in front of everyone to assert his manliness. And my mother was like, oh, oh, if only he was smarter, if only he was. So they always put me down and I always had low self-esteem. Added to this, they would never buy me anything. I'm telling you, if you notice with my daughter, whenever I go shopping, anything she wants, every day she gets one. My mother and stepfather, I told you, you know, they were well to do. They say, not even a chocolate, a Kit Kat, a chewing gum, anything I would ask them, no money. Actually, they would tell me, we don't have money. We don't, have, not we didn't bring money, we don't have money. So, Galaxy, Snickers, those days, Mars, we should go to these outlets, Choitram and Lal's, they were big supermarkets. I would always want to eat a chocolate and they would keep the chocolate near the cash counter. Never. Okay. And on top of that, I loved reading books. Story books. You know, Eden Blyton and Tinkle. Uh, Indian books. Uh, Indians would know this. There's a book called Tinkle and Amar Chitra Katha. These publishers. Uh, these are comic books. I would love to read them. They would now buy it for me because they would tell me no money. Okay. There's no money for books. There's no money for chocolates. Even food, even if I wanted, I loved almonds. I love, no, no, we don't have money. And later on, I found out when my stepbrother was there, they would keep this, they would buy and keep it hidden in the bedroom. I would be made to sleep in the living room, hall room. Okay. So... And what did I know? I thought this was the normal way of raising a child. They would not allow TV in the house. The only TV would be after uh, stepfather would come back, father, whatever. And we would watch a little bit of cartoon, 4 o'clock. Those days in Dubai, 4 o'clock, some cartoons used to come. Sesame Street or whatever. Uh, Disney, you know, Mickey Mouse or whatever. Just half an hour and then... They would resume their programming and we would watch, before the news, we would watch maybe Knight Rider, Airwolf. You can Google search these names or the Incredible Hulk TV series. But I was never given access to no TV, no video, no listening to music, no phone, even phone. We are not allowed. Uh, and here's a bigger thing. They wouldn't even allow me to play with the friends outside. If we are staying in a building, you know, we say two, three buildings in a 
everyone's playing down, but I'm locked in the house. I would just see from the toilet and they would say, come down, come down, Loy, but I couldn't go. And if there was a problem, my parents would never support me. They would support the children. So being told you are good for nothing at home, good for nothing at school, good for nothing in front of other people, good for nothing even in the church, being abused, not allowed to read books, uh, being compared to others, told you are a mistake. Their whole life, in fact, even when I wished them Merry Christmas, seriously, huh? this is not a joke. I saved money, the food money that she used to give me, to buy cards for her, for my stepfather and small gift. I gave it to her on 24th before the thing. She looked at what is this? Why are you wasting money? And she threw the card. I remember that. And then I asked myself, I was 17, 18. Why am I giving her a card? Even my father. And when I won any co-curricular activities like public speaking, just imagine I drafted my speech by myself and I got first place. Okay, there were two or three people, not many. I got just a certificate. She would say, what is the use of this? If you would get first rank and she actually threw it. Threw it. I, f I, I really felt like even breakdowns, you know, that time Michael Jackson's bad was there. I was actually watching him copying the moves. And then I, by myself, took an empty cassette tape, recorded some hip-hop music. Imagine, I'm listening to Michael Jackson but dancing for hip-hop. Went to some local, there was some local Indian association where different, different schools, everyone had their parents. I came there alone. You know, what did I wear? I, I tied a belt. I tied, you know, this, this rubbery uh, strip that you tie the books. I borrowed it from someone. I tied one to my leg. I put my socks on top of one leg. I put some uh, exercise band here. I put an exercise thing here. I look like a clown. And I walked by myself, I think, 15, 20 minutes to that place. I paid the 20 bucks without any parental support. They never wanted to, they never even helped me get a audio tape or video tape. I borrowed everything. I did this at the age of, I think, 14, 15 or whatever. And <laughs> there were only three people who took part. One was a very chubby girl. One was another girl who was slim, but she was doing some Hindi dance. And me, I was dancing very fast. <laughs> I was so nervous. I was looking at my feet and sports. I was, oh, by the way, I was wearing football shoes with spikes. Uh, I was looking down. And everyone, you know, all the patans and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were, <laughs> so I got first place because there were only three people. And my English, uh, he was the one. He said, you got the first place. I was very happy and. He told me not to tell anyone. I told the girl and didn't pitch me. He said, come here. Stop telling other people. Okay. And they gave a small cheap trophy and certificate. I gave that to my parents. They just threw it. Man. They said, what is this? What, what is the use of that? She kept it near the shoe rack. So this continued my whole life. Uh, being told not good enough. And then when my stepbrother came into our lives, he was always better than me, smarter than me. When my mother had to even deposit money in the bank, she would take him with, with her to the ATM. He knew the password, everything, but I was asked to stand outside. Seriously, huh? not a joke. And I was 17 or 18 or 19 that time. And my brother was, I think, eight, nine years younger to me. I used to always think, why? Like, my mother and father would sleep in the bedroom with him. He sleep on the floor. And he had access to nuts, chocolates, uh, pistachios, dry gifts, rich food. But for me, no. Because I used to eat a lot. But I was also very smart. When they would go out, I would secretly go in. You know, unlock it. Cheap cupboards you can unlock very easy and has to eat it from the inn. Even my grandmother, the bitch of a woman, she used to prepare the good food for him, like good apples she would keep separate, yogurt she would bring and say, hey, you son of a bitch, she would call me all these names and 
I would give a fuck. I would shameless. I would just eat. Like even prawns, they would secretly cook. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Thankfully, I am. I'm glad I'm not like that. Anyway, uh, but one thing is, where my parents never allowed me to have one single book. My daughter, no, my daughter and my wife. I've told them any non-fiction book or self-improvement book or book you want to read, unlimited. Just let me know what it is. Buy it. Don't hesitate. And I shared one Facebook uh, post where one day when I was walking in the mall, uh, we have only one Tesco shopping mall. As we were walking, my little daughter, she saw some books. This, this is the first time huh? I put it as a Facebook post. She ran. She went to the fa she went to the section where there were books. One book which was like ABC and uh, like a story, like coloring book and this and that and it was slightly expensive because it is you know a store in the mall she took it and and I still remember she was like small below I think two years three, sorry three years three years or so and she looked at the book and uh, my wife was not sure that time so I she went to my wife and my wife said ask papa so uh, she didn't know how to talk that time, like not much. She came and I don't know why she was just holding it and, and like she was just holding and looking at me. I just carried her. I said, what do you want? You want a book? Book, book. Like yeah, she was showing me all. <laughs> I teared up, you know, I teared up and because I could see Loy Mesido, a small boy, when he wanted to buy a book and he would stand there and my mother would just give it back, come, 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 stop wasting it. But I took my baby and I asked that uh, lady uh, how much for this and she, you know, obviously, saleswoman, she said uh, there are two, there's a collection of three books or something. I said, uh, can you just get it? So she got it. And my wife looked, they were slightly expensive, premium books, because uh, from abroad, printing. So I just, just, just buy it, just buy it. So my wife, are you sure you want to buy? I said, just buy it. Later on, we can get some cheaper version if you want. For now, take it. So after my daughter took, uh, my wife said, say, thank you, Papa. And, you know, she hugged me and, and throughout the day, she was looking at this book. And for me, I just looked at my daughter and I was like, and I'm glad I could correct the damage that my parents had done. And, um, you know, I've tried to be, I've tried to be a better parent. Anyway, that's, that's a different thing. So now coming to my parents, this continued, you know, this negativity, this abuse, this beating. In fact, the last time that my stepfather hit me, the last time, I think I was 16 or 17 or 18, whatever. In those days, I used to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger, Van Damme, you know, all those muscular guys, Rambo, Commando and Van Damme. So there was this movie, Blood Sport, which Van Damme is like, you know, they show initial part of the movie is where he goes to fight and this Chinese guy or whatever beats the hell out of him. He gets injured. Then he goes to this forest. You have this Miyagi type karate kid kind of thing. And there he is made to hit bamboo <laughs> trees with his leg and become strong. And he would hit him and yeah, he would be like this. So I was like, hmm. It's a good way to get muscles because I didn't know better. So from then on, I was waiting. Like if my father hates me, I'll tighten my muscles so I'll become strong. <laughs> so it's so funny. I was 18, I long hair. And my father, but this is something he shouldn't have done. You know, Razor Ramon, no, who is from WWE. So I had 
I'd taken a haircut where I had like like a razor Ramon thing. This guy, what he did was, imagine I'm 16, 17, 18. He says, what is this? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to look like a hippie, you know, with a mullet and all that. Look, uh, handsome, like, you know, razor Ramon. He actually did this. He grabbed my hair, took the scissor, cut it. I was boiling, man. I was very hurt. I was like going to cry. And, and then on top of that, he started, what you'll do? What you'll do? What you're looking at me angry? Start challenging me. And then he hit me. <laughs> so, so funny when I think about it today. The minute he hit me, <laughs> he slapped me or something. I, I can't recollect. He slapped me or something. I just said, bastard, I'll hit you. I'll kill you or something like bastard, motherfucker. Something I said, bastard, I'll... I just raised my hand. <laughs> this guy is shorter than me. My mother was there. He was like, hey. <laughs> he actually, he actually shrieked and he jumped behind my mom. And that's where I actually realized he is actually a coward, man. And uh, my mom kept, what, what, Loy? What is this? Lavi? My, my nickname was Lavi. Lavi, what is this? This is the way to treat your father? He is your papa? Your, what? Cool down, cool down. <laughs> yeah, so funny. Actually, you know, the crying tears and all that, I, everything, I was like, in this case, I should say, because I was a very timid guy, you know, I'm not a violent type of gangster. So I think he got shocked, my mom got shocked. And from that day onwards, he never tried to hit me or anything. Okay. Because I guess he realized I was going to give him back. But uh, he still tried his toxicity. Like, example, when I saved money and bought a second-hand bike, it was rusted and all that. This guy never allowed me to bring it in the house. He would always tell me, keep it out. Even at 18, 19, I kept it out and someone stole it. I was heartbroken, man. It took me three months to save money for it. I was depressed. Thankfully, instead of being a shameless bastard there, he bought it after a month. He bought uh, another bike. But uh, that really broke my heart. You know, that's how he was, man. He was always like that. Even when he caught me with my first love letter, at the age of, I think, 12 or 14, I gave it to one girl to give it to somebody else. This girl was supposed to be like a common family friend, so to speak. And little did I know that after I gave her the letter, next day, being a Friday, we would go to the house for some communion, this thing. And she went and told my father, ah, he gave this love letter. I just wrote in that, I want to be your friend, you know, I like you. He immediately took me home with my wife and, and sorry, with the, my mom. He beat me violently yeah, with a sick read. And I was reading that and he would whack me with a cane and all that. Because it seems I spoiled his name. So that kind of individual. So now comes, how did I overcome this or what did I do? There's no way you can change your toxic parents. I tried for, oh, even after all the abuse, until the age of, man, until age of nearly 40, I tried making peace. I tried talking things out. I tried bringing up the power. Like, why did you hit me, man? Like, I would just ask him. And he would just say, like, you're questioning me? How dare you question me? Who are you? I made you. And he would talk to me like that. In, in fact, even the girl I wanted to get married to, the 18-year-old whose face I tattooed here, and I bought her to introduce him. Can you imagine how toxic my parents are? My mother took this girl in, who was 18, I was 30. I bought to speak about marriage. She took the girl inside and gave my younger brother's photograph to her and said, this law is a womanizer, get married to this. We will support you, we will take care of you. And I found this out only after this girl sat with me in the car. She was very sad, very upset. I was like, why are you upset? You just met my parents. We're talking about marriage. 
thing yeah, your mother just told me and she showed the photograph and I was shocked that is how my mother father mother stepfather were they just looked at me as a financial uh, investment not even as a human being so even after trying i i realized they would never change so the first thing which i did was one is i stayed separate which helped me in more ways than one the second one was i kept my life private away from them i never told them anything because the more they would know the more they would interfere i tried my level best to communicate with them take them out for dinners movies spend time hug them hold them walk with them talk with them discuss business anything no fucking use man in fact uh, i would say the last few ending days uh i was nearly going to i don't know almost like kill the guy not actually kill but like imagine i i went home this is when i'm 36 or something or 35 or something uh, yeah this was before 35 when i went to talk to him about getting married and uh, i forgive imagine i still forgive my mother for showing my step brother's photograph and i was talking to him about business and starting something new and i'm 35 he is unemployed for years and years my my mother is sitting there i'm you know thinking about what to do next and he's insulting me like you're not a you're not a man he's telling me you're not a man i'm like what he's saying you are a loser you're nothing he is insulting me huh? i'm like i'm talking to him nicely i said why are you insulting who are you lawyer you are a nothing he kept at it kept at it until i finally lost my mother. and i told him sir i said motherfucker i'll break your fucking face man i'll fucking kill you then my mother intervened i said you are living like a fucking uh, like a dog under my mother eating the free money don't talk much you have nothing to talk about they would make my blood boil in fact even after i came to island samui i tried introducing my wife even showed my baby the only thing my mother had to talk about was money and she needs money and she has these issues and i have to take care of her she looked after me for so many years and like what the fuck are you talking man and she wanted to know my wife where she stays uh, what is her education me coming to the money like how much money do you have i was like this this woman is shameless man and my stepfather uh, like i'm i'm introducing my wife and the baby at least smile hmm okay and that also they don't have any money they are useless in fact you know my suicide when i was about to kill myself at the age of 36 suicide and i asked my mother for help she not only did not help me she even called my relatives who were in india and told them not to help me she does not help me and she convinced those people who wanted to help me to refuse to help me even though she knew as going to commit suicide that is how toxic my mother and stepfather were uh i can go on and on but all i'll tell you is if you have toxic parents the best way is keep them away from your life that's one stay separate avoid any interaction let them not know anything about your life and if possible break off that relationship without actually saying it just vanish you don't need to keep in touch with them because there are some people who really should not be parents here some people really should not be parents just don't know why they want to have children anyway you know all this you see these tattoos and these imperfections it's all because of 
I never had any upbringing. I had to train myself, I had to learn myself. And that's why I am where I am. I'm all self-made. I educated myself, I studied by myself, I went to coaching by myself, I made mistakes by myself, everything. And yes, I've been lucky. If you honestly ask me, how do you handle toxic parents? The answer is very simple. You have to cut them away from your life, keep them so far away, that's it. Never, ever, ever have them. Then you'll be at peace of mind. Anyway, didn't think this would be such a long video, but um, let me know your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts below. And remember, don't seek their validation, don't seek their approval, don't seek their blessing, don't seek anything. You can't change them. Just be on your own, live your own life, create your own life, your own legacy, your own future. You'll be happier. That's all I have to say. All right? You guys take care. This is me signing off.